Hello and welcome to Dollars and Cents, the Australian Institute podcast where we explain just what the hell is going on in the economy. My name is Greg Jericho. I'm the Chief Economist at the Australia Institute. And joining me, as always, is our podcast producer, Jennifer Macy. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Greg. So this week, the GDP numbers came out and they're not looking good. Well, Australia's economic growth has basically ground to a halt. A dismal 0.1%. That is, not including the pandemic, the weakest rate of growth since the early 90s. With fears the nation is a heartbeat away from a recession. There's a whole generation of Australians who've never seen anything like this. Any growth is welcome uh, in these domestic and global circumstances that we confront. No, not good. And and just before we get to them, just a quick reminder, everyone, what GDP is. GDP is this thing that comes out every three months where essentially the Bureau of Statistics tries to measure everything that's going on in the economy. Um, it's only everything that actually involves the transfer of money. So if you're doing any volunteer work or if you're actually uh, taking care of your kids or doing your own uh Washing it at home, sorry, that's not included in the GDP figures, but basically everything where you're changing money, where it's you're spending money, where the government's spending money, whereas whether you're building a house or a mining company is building a new mine, it's all counted, all the exports, all the imports, and they try and work out just how fast or slow the economy is going. And, yeah, this, this quarter in the March quarter, very slow. And what were the actual numbers? Yeah, the the big number that we focus on, the actual quarterly GDP growth, that just went up 0.1%. So barely anything, really. It's kind of a rounding error away from nothing and almost sort of going backwards. And when the GDP starts going backwards, that's when we start worrying about recessions and everything. So GDP only went up 0.1%. In the past year, it went up 1.1%, which that might sound better, But actually, we kind of are aiming for around 2.8 to 3%, so 1.1, shocking. But one of the other things about the GDP figures is they also include population growth. So because it's counting everything that's in the economy, if more people come into the economy, well, there's more people spending money, more people buying things. So population growth actually just helps the economy grows. So what they also do is a thing called GDP per capita, where they kind of strip out the population growth and just see, okay, how much did the economy grow per head of person? And well, in the March quarter, it went backwards on a per capita basis. It fell minus 0.4%. Now, the worst thing about that, though, that was the fifth quarter in a row that our economy has fallen on a per capita basis. Fifth quarter in the row. The last time that happened, uh, it's never happened before. Really? That is the longest stretch of the economy going backwards on a per capita basis ever. We started measuring per capita back in 1973. We've never had five quarters in a row. If you look at the annual growth over the past year, if you strip out population, our economy actually shrunk 1.3%. That's terrible, really bad. It's a sign of an economy that basically take out population growth. We're going backwards. If we didn't have population growth, we would definitely be in a recession. And even with population growth, we're really close to stalling. Wow, that sounds terrible. I mean... (laughs) Yeah, it's it's hard to sugarcoat that really. It's hard to, when you when you start breaking records and also, you know, even if we include population growth and look at that 1.1% growth, you think, okay, well, how bad does that be? Surely we have it worse than that usually. Well, if we take out what happened during the pandemic where everything went a bit mad, that 1.1% growth is the worst annual growth in the economy we've had since 1992. Now, if you go, for those of you like me and you, Jennifer, yep. 1992 in the early 90s was not a good time in the economy. We were in a deep recession. That was just as we were coming out of it. So the fact that we're referring back to the early 90s of how bad thing, you know, it's been, hasn't been this bad since then, it's a, just a really sort of a good sign of how bad things are really. You know, we, it's really hard to kind of sugarcoat this and say, oh, these, these numbers aren't too bad. No, they're pretty shocking. 
So if I think back to, you know, high school geography, when we think about GDP figures, we also include in that export numbers. Um, What are our export numbers doing? Normally we rely on our mining exports to kind of push the economy along. Is that happening this time? Look, the exports did grow, um, not by a lot, but what happened was we actually did import a fair bit of stuff and what we care about with GDP is the thing called net exports, which is exports minus imports because imports are things that we've bought from overseas, so we're not producing them. So it's not really something that is a a benefit to our economy, whereas exports are where we're getting more money coming into the economy, essentially. So we sort of take one away from the other. And that was the problem this quarter. We actually imported more than we exported or the increase in imports was bigger than the increase in the exports. And so actually our trade, what we call detracted from GDP growth, it actually lowered GDP growth this time. So if export growth had been as strong as it had been, you know, over the past couple of years, we probably would have seen a, a stronger figure. But also it's a case of, you know, we don't want to be just reliant on our exports to keep powering our growth because think about what are our big exports, with our iron ore, the gas, the coal. There's not a lot of um, money for you and me coming from these things. Most of it's going to major companies. A lot of it is multinational companies. A lot of those profits are going overseas. People in this economy, the consumers who make up more than 50% of the economy, they're not really doing all that great from those type of exports. So even the fact that trade sort of uh, took GDP down, even if you strip that out, things aren't looking good anyway. Looks like it's going to be a very tough year for Australians and for the Albanese government this year. Really the inevitable consequence of these rate rises which are in the system uh, combined with this global economic uncertainty. If it turns out, for example, that inflation starts to go up again or it's much stickier than we think, we're not getting it down, then we won't hesitate to move and raise interest rates again. So if we have a look at the economy then overall, um, why are things so slow? The overwhelming reason why things are going slow is interest rates. The Reserve Bank has raised interest so, so sharply and so dramatically that it has massively slowed our spending, massively slowed household spending. And because our household spending, everything the households buy, whether that be in the shops or whether that's paying our bills, because that makes up a bit over 50% of the entire economy, when our spending really slows, that slows the whole economy. And what we're seeing is the impact of those interest rates has been to dramatically slow our spending and also dramatically lower, in a sense, our living standards, the amount of money that we have after you take away taxes and those interest rate repayments. Once you take away that, our household disposable income has absolutely plummeted and we're really doing it tough. And because we're doing it tough, the economy does it tough. Can I just be devil's advocate here and ask, what else could the RBA have done when faced with such, you know, kind of rapidly growing inflation rates? You know, it seems like they've, they only have one tool in their toolbox. Should they not have used it? Yeah, it's, it, it's this thing of, you know, the Reserve Bank, you're right, basically only has one tool and it's that old line that we, we've often used, you know, when all you've got is a habit, every problem looks like a nail. And this is the thing that we have been at the Australian Institute have been arguing for a fair while now that, this, this inflation rate that we have been seeing, this rise in prices, it hasn't come from households being really flush with cash and going out and spending mad. No, what we've been seeing is actually our spending hasn't been all that strong. There hasn't been really strong wages growth. In fact, wages are, haven't even been able to keep up with inflation at all. So our real wages, our purchasing power has fallen and yet... The Reserve Bank has been treating this bout of inflation the same way as it did during the mining boom when, yes, we were pretty flush with cash. People did have a lot of income. John Howe was giving us lots of tax cuts as well and handing out a fair bit of uh, um, family tax benefit B to people who probably didn't need it. There was lots of money going around the economy and the Reserve Bank kind of wanted to slow it and so they raised interest rates. 
This time round, they've kind of acted exactly the same way, even though we know that inflation has mostly been driven by supply shocks from overseas that have raised prices and companies taking advantage of this situation to be able to raise prices because they had market power. And it's only kind of right now that we're finally starting to see wages going up faster than inflation. So you could even only now sort of suggest that maybe wages are having a bit of an impact on prices, but even that is bugger all. So it's a case of, yes, yes, the Reserve Bank needed to raise interest rates to kind of get us back to normal, but we would argue they went too far. And I don't think it's actually had as much of an impact on inflation as the freeing up of supply side issues have overseas, the inability for companies now to really take advantage of the sense of rising inflation to increase their profits. And what we're seeing now is not so much inflation coming down, but it's more about actually uh, the economy is coming down. And that's always the problem with raising interest rates really fast, really dramatically, is, yeah, it might slow inflation, but is it going to slow the actual economy too fast? And when that happens, you go into recessions. And it, it happens because even if um, even if inflation isn't due to our massive spending, if you raise interest rates, that's going to stop us spending. So if we weren't spending a lot in the first place, now we're going to spend even less. And to put it in context, during the mining boom, you know, flush with cash, interest rates rose. What has happened in the past two years in terms of the increase in our interest rate repayments, they've gone up 132% in the past two years. The same thing happened during the mining boom, but that happened over the course of five years. So in a sense, they've done in two years what during the mining boom period, the biggest boom in Australian history for ages, they did that in five years. And you think about just, you know, how dramatic an impact that has on people's ability to spend and how quickly it slows things down. So we're spending less. But how does overall GDP numbers affect households, how households are faring? Yeah, it's a good question because a lot of people are like, okay, wh why do I care about GDP? What's, what's the importance of GDP? GDP doesn't measure what I do at home, taking care of my kids. Is GDP just a bit of a meaningless number? And look, I, I realise that GDP, when we're talking, it can all sound like a lot of econo babble. It certainly doesn't measure everything in the economy. It doesn't measure everything that's important in our lives. I can generally say, though, it's better to have a GDP going up than it is going down. When the economy is shrinking, things generally aren't good. And the main reason why I care about GDP is there's a pretty good link between GDP growth, between the growth in the economy and changes in the unemployment rate. Generally, over the last sort of 40 to 50 years, to keep unemployment steady so it's not going up, we kind of need the economy each year to be growing at about 2.75%, 2.8%. When it grows slower than that, generally we start seeing unemployment rising. And, you know, it's only rose in a, a little bit in the past year, but it certainly has gone up. And the worry is that if the economy doesn't start picking up soon, if we still have this slow growth, then we're actually going to see unemployment really rise. And I care a lot more about unemployment when I'm talking about recessions than I do actual GDP growth. If unemployment starts going up, you know, half a percentage point, we start getting up to around four and a half percent, that's going to really seem like a recession for most people because mm. there's going to have been a lot of job losses. That's why we should care about GDP because of that link between unemployment because as I say, within the GDP figures, it does measure how much household spend. It measures how much we spend on food, whether we're buying new cars. It measures how much we have to spend on bills, on our insurance, on our rent, on government fees and charges, everything that we have to spend. It measures how much tax we have to pay. It measures how much interest rates we have to pay. All of these things are measured so we can really look at household living standards from these figures. And one of the things, you have to do a little bit of maths with these figures. Unfortunately, the ABS doesn't actually give this figure, but you're actually able to work out what's our household disposable income per capita. So again, trying to strip out that population growth. 
And when you look at that, our level of household disposable income in the first three months of this year was pretty much at the same level it was in real terms. So take out population growth, take out inflation. It's basically our living standards are now where they were 10 years ago in 2014. Does that mean that we're squirreling away all the money for a rainy day? Are we saving it up for a recession? No, no. When we're talking disposable income, that is how much you have left after you take away taxes paid, your interest repayments, the things you have to pay, and also taking into account inflation. And when you've done that, when you look what we've got left over, basically we've got about the same amount left over as we did 10 years ago. That means our living standards over the past 10 years essentially haven't grown. We're stagnant. And that's not how it's meant to be. Our living standards are meant to improve. We're meant to have more money to buy more things this year than we did last year. And what we've seen because of the rise in inflation, because our incomes have not kept up with prices, because interest rate repayments have increased so dramatically, our living standards have crashed. And also, you know, your your question about are we screwing away? No, our savings ratio has plummeted. The GDP figures also measure how much we save. How much of our income do we actually save? Before the pandemic, we were saving about, on average, and this is, again, on average across the entire economy, so some of our listeners were going, yeah, I wasn't saving that much. We were saving about 6 to 7% of our income. Now we're saving just under 1% of our income. It's been a dramatic drop, essentially, we're not saving money. We haven't got any money to save. We're having everything that we're earning, we're spending. Either it's going in taxes, it's going in interest rate repayments, or it's going to buy things that we need to buy. These numbers show that we got the budget exactly right. This is a justification for the government's approach to fighting inflation without smashing the economy given growth was already soft and people were already under pressure. So what should the government or the RBA be doing now to stave off a recession? Yeah, well, certainly the Reserve Bank, I think, should be looking at these figures and really thinking, okay, no more interest rate rises. We really have gone pretty close to to killing the economy. Let's not risk it any further because the slower the economy goes, the higher the risks that any future rate rises are going to actually kill the economy. So you really got to be careful now. Whether or not they'll think about lowering, I don't think this will change too much because they were kind of anticipating it was going to be slowing, but this, I think, should reinforce no more interest rate rises. Um, the government, I think, would be looking at these figures, and I know the Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, has been saying, actually, these figures kind of reinforce why we're doing the stage three tax cuts, why they're doing the energy supplement, because people are struggling. The tax cuts are going to deliver a benefit. We actually won't see that in the GDP figures until the September quarter figures, which we'll only see in December. So it's going to take a while for those tax cuts to show up in the in all the figures. But it certainly shows, you know, we're not saving a lot. We're not actually spending a lot. And that's the real problem. Our household spending was really slow. And what we were spending it on, the increase in our spending was on essential items. Over the past year, our spending in real terms on essential items grew about 2%. That's not that great, but, you know, at least it's going up. But our spending on discretionary items, those things that you can put off for another day, you only buy if you're feeling kind of flush, you can afford it. Over the past year, that just grew in real terms by 0.1%. In effect, we were not spending any more on these discretionary items than we were a year ago. And that's a real sign that you're struggling because generally when households are feeling good, you go out and buy things that you don't need, you know, that, that are things that you want, things that you will make life nicer for you, but, you know, you can afford to do it because you're feeling like, oh, yeah, I can still pay the bills and we can go to JB Hi-Fi or Harvey Norman or we can go to department stores or clothes shopping. We can do those things because actually we're feeling kind of good. When we're not doing those things, that's a really good sign that, hey, we're struggling. And so I think... Certainly, the Reserve Bank, please, God, hell, 
no more rate rises, please. I don't think there will be rate cuts. If there is, it will only be later on, maybe November, more likely December and probably February. Um, but certainly I think what the government the government would look at these and go, the stage three tax cuts are good, good that they've changed them so that they help those on the lower incomes because the old stage three were going to give bugger all to lower middle income earners, so that wouldn't have helped these figures at all. So I think that's what uh, is a good sign, but certainly it's a sign that... Uh, we really need to start thinking a bit more cleverly about how we think about inflation and how it's meant to be tackled because clearly it's not because we're going out and spending lots. It's because of other factors. So rate rises are not going to help those other factors. Rate rises aren't going to bring down your insurance bill. Mm. Rate rises aren't going to bring down your rent. Rate rises are not going to bring down your electricity costs. Rate rises are not going to bring down your education or your health bills. So why would you be raising rates to stop that. You know, pretty much the only reason why there was any sort of good growth in the economy in the March quarter from household spending was, well, we had Taylor Swift, so there was a lot of spending on services. There was some good concerts, some good uh, sporting some events. Buying of sequins. Yeah, all the sequins, all, all the uh, things for the uh, friendship bracelets. But really, other than that, everything was a bit sad and a bit mopey and probably the next quarter is going to be a little bit like that as well. And then hopefully we start seeing the tax cuts kick in, give people a bit more sort of confidence, a bit more optimism about the future, and they can go out and start spending again. Hopefully the economy can start going up again. Okay. Well, thanks so much for your time today, Greg. Yeah. um, Whenever we talk about GDP figures, it really is reinforcing that economics is the dismal science. (laughs) It can be a bit sad, but I think it's really important that we demystify what all these things are so that people, when they're hearing GDP figures, why should I care? Well, care because we kind of do want the economy to grow so that employment keeps growing, so that unemployment doesn't rise. And and also when they think, oh, well, why is it going down? Well, yes, your interest rate rises are having an impact. It's not just you personally, it's across the country. Everyone is feeling it. It's just in some ways it's a good thing to just reinforce that it's not just you, it's all of us who are feeling this way. Yeah. But thank you, everyone, for listening. We will be back again next week. This episode was recorded on Thursday the 6th of June and some things may have changed. You can find my column with all the graphs about the GDP figures at Guardian Australia's site on the Grogonomics page. And for more research, especially on why the Reserve Bank should not keep raising interest rates, go to our website, which is at australiainstitute.org.au. My Twitter handle and the handle I use for all social media is at Grog Scammit and Jennifer Macy is at Jennifer Macy. Our theme music is from Blue Dot Sessions. See you all next week. Mm-hmm.